record to the cloud. Good to go. Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin again, and welcome to Digital Rebar Online Meetup number five. We hope you're all doing well. We've got a, a cast of new folks and old folks on the meetup with us today. Uh, we have our usual uh, motley crew from Rackin. If we jump over, we've got uh, Steven Spector, who's running the controls and posing as uh, Rob Hirschfeld today. And we have the actual, real, Mark One, Rob Hirschfeld as well. Uh, Greg Altos and Victor Lowther on board as well from Rackin. And community, we've got our usual cast of characters with Will Dennis and Chris. And we've got some new faces, Carl Perry and Espelebro. Uh, welcome, guys. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, just to cover, uh, we're going to recap a little bit on uh, Meetup version 4, what we talked about, and won't be very long there. Um, as always, our, on, our format is online, and we uh, record and post to all of the various media outlets, primarily YouTube, and uh, someday we might be doing some physical meetups in the San Francisco Bay Area or um, Austin, Texas area where our crew is at. So if you guys have an interest in a physical meetup sometime, let us know. We're also working on some cooperative meetups with some of the other um, San Francisco Bay Area meetup groups with the um, Bay Area Kubernetes and the Bay Area OpenStack and the Bay Area uh, HashiCore user groups. So in the next few months, hopefully you'll see some interesting cooperative uh, meetups coming down the line from those different venues. Uh, today, we're going to do a little bit of a discussion on uh, runner and jobs, which was our original uh, meeting agenda discussion topics, and we've since expanded things quite a bit. We've added some uh, poor profiles and orchestration changes we're going to talk about, have a little bit of community feedback we want to talk, talk about, see what we want to put on the roadmap for our next meetup. And we're going to talk about version 3.3, which actually released uh, not just 24 hours ago, and we have some new features and uh, pieces in there, the subnet uh, API has been tweaked a little bit. So we've uh, modified the, or uh, rather versions, the uh, minor version based on the API change. And we're gonna do a little bit of backlog status and grooming. Uh, and we've got some upcoming changes coming up to how we are building and using DRP CLI internally. We'll talk about that and then wrap up. Um, going back to version four, uh, we had a bit of discussion on understanding stages, which was the primary content for uh, the version four meetup. And I wanted to bring that up briefly because we're sort of continuing the discussion around stages today, uh, talking about the job queue and runners, since the job queue and the runner is responsible for um, sort of implementing all of the interesting things that we do within stages to advance stages and do stuff in stages. It's also the backbone of what we'll be talking a little bit about in terms of uh, using uh, parameters and profiles for some interesting cross-node orchestration capabilities. Uh, and so there's a whole sort of theme tie-in there. Uh, we talked a little bit about the version 3.2 uh, release, uh, and we had to actually cut 3.2 on 3.2.1 versions. And we discussed a little bit about moving to a faster release cadence, which you're starting to see now with a major release um, or not a major release, a minor release of so version 3.3, which we've cut. And hopefully we're going to continue that accelerated pace of uh, more frequent, smaller changes. Uh, did I miss anything from version 4 meetup? I don't think so. That was the primary aspects. For those of you who uh, missed or didn't get a chance to see the understanding stages stuff, there's a slide, slide word demonstration uh, of stages and how stages work. So you might want to go back and review that afterwards. All of that information is posted in the version four uh, meetup uh, notes and agenda notes. Um, so getting started today, uh, we're going to move right into discussion on runner and jobs. So I'm basically just gonna kick a few questions at uh, Greg and Victor and actually Rob as well, since he's here, he wasn't with us last week, off doing important things. Uh, so, First of all, um, Greg or Victor, what, either you two want to field, um, what is the runner? Let's start with that. I mean, just give us a real fast lowdown on what the runner really is. The runner runs things on machine. <laughs> awesome. 
be so eloquent. Ow, eloquent. Super <laughs> aptly named. <laughs> All right. So what is the runner useful for then besides uh, just running things? Give us some ideas of what, what we do with the runner. You mean uh, – I have oh. one too here. Okay, so some examples. Um, once you get system inventory, we do that uh, via the runner. We tell the runner to run go high and grab its output and uh, shove it into a parameter. Um, you want to wipe out your hard drives in preparation for uh, installing an OS. Um, that is another task that is run via the runner. And at a higher level, the runner is responsible for uh, executing all of the tasks on the current machine based off of whatever stage it happens to be in at the current time. All right. Okay, so Rob, were you thinking about this a digital rebar runner workflow? Slide? Uh, Although it looks a little different because this I, morning. For some reason, I'm not able to see now. the screen. Hold on, let me let me bring up another client. It's not just keep going. Just keep, right, going. just keep going. So basically, what we're referring to everyone here is if we take a look at the, the screen share, we have a digital rebar provision is the blue blob on the uh, Rob. I changed your screen, yeah, so it's not all. You're, you're in the right one. Okay, and so the blue blob is the rebar provision endpoints, and it um, we're talking about uh, the stages, the the green uh, rectangle, uh, which uh, implements its work in, uh, via tasks and jobs uh, on the DRP side, and uh, on the machine side, that's actually the target machine that's being installed. Uh, the red block box is the boot environment that you install, for example, Ubuntu 16.04. Uh, the runner is actually what we're talking about here, and it's the purple magenta-ish box. It's kind of hard to distinguish that color, I think, but uh, the magenta box is the, where the runner is actually running. And we implement the runner simply as the DRP CLI in a special mode. So we enable, we call DRP CLI, we start it up in a special mode. It, to, uh, it, it talks back to the digital rebar provision end, endpoint. Uh, and it basically is looking for jobs in its queue. And that's what this flow is on. Um, Rob, Greg, Victor, you want to sort of expound upon that? I mean, it's, I mean, in some regards, that's as simple as it is. It's, it's a DRP CLI running the process jobs machine command inside of a boot environment. It doesn't have to be, but it happens to be inside the boot environment that the machine's running. And that process basically runs until it's told to stop, either by a return code from a task, or when it changes stage, um, it can be told to stop as well. And so it acts as a blocking function. So for example, in the install boot environments, the um, DRP CLI will, or runner, will run until some task tells it to stop, at which point then the install process will finish and reboot. So that's an important kind of subtlety about this to some degree, is that when you're using the runner and thinking about setting up your like workflow and stage sequencing, you need to be aware of, um, especially for the install ones, what will stop the runner? <laughs> and so um, you need to make sure you either have a stage that is set to runner, no, uh, runner wait to false so that that stage stops the runner or there's a task that stops the runner or as part of the stage transition, it marks the runner as stopping. So that's just a, I mean, a little note. Um, let's see what else about this. Um, the process jobs action or runner as we call it um, is responsible for getting the tasks as actions from DRP for that specific machine. And while DRP sequences the tasks and converts them into the jobs that you see inside of the um, UI and the rest of the system to get the status of the uh, jobs that are run or tasks that are run, the CLI is just asking uh, specifically for the tasks on that machine. So it, it's very scope limited and based upon the boot environment, usually it's security limited to just the tasks it can see. 
Okay. See, I knew you could say something more uh, eloquently and interesting besides it just runs things. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so what are, um, Victor, do you have any thoughts on um, how do we actually interact with, from an operator standpoint, uh, runner and, and jobs? What are some of the, the operational things um, I'm thinking sort of along the lines of, uh, I want to show what jobs are running. I want to look at, you know, what jobs are associated with the machine during an install process and sort of introspect in what's going on. Can you give us a, a sort of a rundown of some of the operator interaction points? Um, most of what you're going to see there is a combination of uh, looking at the jobs for specific machines via the, uh, the job section in the UX or the CP or the CLI or, and uh, you know, see what uh, things are currently running on a machine. Um, has the, I don't know, have we tweaked the overview page to show that yet? I don't think we have. Uh, no. I don't think we have. No. The overview from a runner's perspective? No, that's on our list to do. Okay. Same with, same with machines themselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty much the, the way the runner keeps track of what it needs to do is it looks exclusively at the... Uh, at the machines, we can we maintain a list of tasks that have been added to the machine, and uh, we maintain a, an entry into that list called current task, which is just uh, an index into the list of that points at the task that is currently running. And as the runner does its thing, it increments that index until it's out of things to do. Okay. And uh, what about um, is there an easy way to associate specific jobs? that are coming off the job queue with a host to uh, just look at the status. And so something breaks, how do we sort of figure that out? Um, each individual job has a reference to the machine UID. And so in the uh, UX, you can uh, filter by a specific machine to see what all jobs have been created on that machine, uh, sort it by the runtime or the state. And uh, that'll show you what is happening for any given machine. Um, so as far as a more- Our key there. Sorry, I'm not looking at the UX at the moment. Oh, I was wondering if uh, someone actually has a copy of a uh, DRP uh, running and we can pop up the UX. We can, I can, it's a lot easier to show what's happening there. Yes, just a moment. I'm bringing, oop, bringing it over to here. We get it, we get it, we get it, we get it. All right, so we wanted to look at, where's my endpoint? You wanted to look at what? Jobs, just scroll Job. down. Yeah. I don't, I don't have many. Nope. But you can see that uh, machine is one of the was one of the columns that we list for jobs, and yep. uh, the filter will actually let you the filter will actually let you uh, you know filter out jobs so that you're only looking at jobs for a specific machine. Um, if you okay, pop a is, UID this, in there, this is awesome. That. I haven't even seen this. <laughs> yeah. When did we drop this in? <laughs> oh, this was about about a week and a half ago. Yeah. Yay filter, team. Filter. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to sidetrack us there. Oh no! Well, the, I mean, if 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 you, if you want to get an overview of what's happening, you know, filtering on jobs uh, is the way that I do that. Okay. Um, so we have another cool UX feature. I think that just got merged too. For it. we can save it as the, an app at the end of the meeting. The uh, endpoint admin. Uh, yes, that's exactly. Yeah, that's right. exactly why I was bringing this up. So we'll, I was going to show that in a moment. Cool. So. Okay. Um, okay. Interesting. Uh, I like it. Um, uh, Will and, and Chris out there, you guys, um, you had a lot of questions two weeks ago around uh, stages and we had a very animated discussion on uh, de delving into the runner and the jobs and the, the work queue. Uh, I had to cut us off because we're running out of time, which is why we wanted to extend into this. Uh, meetup discussion. Do you, how do you guys feel about sort of the information you're receiving? Is it helpful? Do you have any questions about all of that process? Yeah, that, that graphic is very helpful. Uh, okay. 
Um, what else? Um, the jobs on the UI, it, that only updates when the job's complete, correct? No, it's dynamic. It's, oh, really? Okay. It's mostly, um, yeah. Do the entries pop in when the job kicks or when the job completes? When the job is created, it will get added with the state of created. It will then move to a state of running when it actually starts to be processed by the runner. And then upon when it's finished, it will either go to finished, indicating success, failed if it failed, and incomplete um, if the task set decided that it wasn't sufficiently done but needed to stop processing for a while. There's special use cases for that. Um, probably don't want to go into it quite right now, but realize that there's a, it can have three return codes. Okay, so I'm looking at the state column, right? Uh-huh. And, okay, so it, it's iconic that, uh, I guess a red exclamation point is a failed, a green trophy is finished, and I don't think I've ever seen any other state. Yeah, well, incomplete won't show up. <laughs> Well, what you said when it gets created. Yeah, so, happens. yeah. Created is ephemeral, and if you catch it in the few microseconds that it's actually set to created before it uh, switches over to running, then you have uh, very good reflexes. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. I, I'm, like, doing installs, and I want to know what's going on right now. <laughs> like, what, what's the, totally you know, I see the yellow bar on overview at which stage it is. Well, that's fine. It's, like what specifically is it doing, you know? So I go to jobs and it was like, it seemed to me like it only was showing completed or failed things and not things that I had yet to do yeah. or things that it is doing. So that's actually an interesting point. The jobs are only, the jobs table is only populated as the actions are taken. So, your, your machine may have a task list of 20 items. As, the, as a item is being processed, its job is created. So for example, if I create a task list of 20, I don't create 20 jobs all at once. You only get a job as the items are created. The, uh, the views that you're asking about are like, what are pending work? What's currently in flight? Those views we still need to construct in the UI. The, the parameters are there on the machine, specifically the task list and the current task index, which is an index into that list, can give you that information, but the UI doesn't reflect that right now. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, okay. if, so, if, so. If, you, if you pop open the, the CLI and you just, do, just show any random machine, um, you'll see the task list and the current task, and those are the two parameters that control what the job runner is doing at any given time. Uh, okay, all right. So yeah, I haven't tried that. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of DRV2 where it had the, the matrix, I call it, and, and it kind of indicated what was done, what it was doing, and what it had yet to do. That was super cool. Oh, yeah. I love that view. That, that's a view that uh, we haven't re-implemented in uh, this UX yet. We're not sure it makes sense, but we do need to have a, this, this machine is doing this thing. Um, we, we don't, we don't build a big graph anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really hard to, to create that, that view. Um, I mean, it, it is an uh, ordered list and right. And I mean, you have a whole stack of, uh, let me get the right terminology. Is it tasks? or jobs, I guess it's jobs, right? Like you, you build, the, or is it dynamically built like, like, hey, I'm doing this thing. Okay, I got done this thing. Give me the next thing. I mean, something has to know what the next thing is. It, it, does that, it is um, all, all? That, that is what is tracked on each machine by the tasks field and the current task field. Right, so, so, and uh, I, I, I don't think we exposed that directly in the UX, but it's, if you look at the, if you 
pull up a machine in the CLI, it's yeah. pretty obvious what's there. Got it. So, so, you know, if the data exists, it could be exposed in some form in the UX. Yeah. Um, the difficulty that Rob is alluding to in digital rebar version two, um, we don't maintain per machine anything for as far as uh, scheduled as, as to what to run. Um, that information is essentially globally present in a gigantic graph that contains every action that ever needs to happen for any given configuration. Um, okay. And, and very powerful notion, but it has its fragility and it's, uh, it tends to get hard to explain as to yeah. why things oh. happen in a specific order. So we switched yeah, well, to a simpler also, model also, that has the side effect of it's uh, harder to, you know, like draw that matrix view because things will pop in and out uh, randomly as the machine switches stages. Right. We, the state, so, so Will, in, in version two, there was, the graph was actually um, pretty hard. It was, it was flexible, but it was pretty hardwired. Mm -hmm. in, in version three, you've got tasks inside of a stage that, that are, are pretty predictable. So we could show you a list of, of expected tasks to run and where you are. But the stages themselves are not that predictable. So there's actually two levels of um, so, so the three. system, the, excuse me, Rob, when the yeah, system's on a stage, it, it, you're saying it does not particularly know what the next stage is and the next stage after that and the next, it's dynamic that way, correct? It, it knows if it gets to the last task or in the new, the latest code, um, and I, I would defer to Greg or Victor to explain it better, but the, the latest, the, the, the three, two, the changes in this latest, latest drop, I'll, stages automatically transition to the next stage, but that can be preempted. So oh, I get, know sort of one stage where it's going to go yeah, next, it. but it's, that's it's not in the dynamic. release yet. It's yeah, that's, the release. that's, that's not in this last off. release. Okay, um, three, three, four. For the current code, uh, the change stage task is the only one that we can rely on to know where things are going to go next. Got ya. Um, Cause that, that is like the pointer, if you will, to the next, Thing. Um, and it changes. It can change, I should say. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm getting. It's, it, it's dynamic that way. It's like, not till it gets there does it say, well, what's the next thing to do? Yeah, and the reason we're moving away from that is um, due to some technical reasons as to uh, how some technical issues with how all that stuff works. Um, it's hard to do like a fan out and fan in pattern where at the, when you hit the end of a certain stage, you want to you know, go, you know, you want to decide what to do next based off of uh, some other parameter that's in the system. Right, um, uh, yeah. right now that involves writing a custom task and we're trying to think of ways to uh, kind of genericize that and embed that and, and embed support for that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, like a common example would be, um, you know, I just finished my discovery, uh, you know, and what I want to do next depends on what the exact type of system I discovered yes, was. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, that, that's why I was pushing for like the go high to be in there because you want to possibly take actions based on go high inventory, right? right? Yeah, yeah, super. The other workflow issue that needs to be addressed is that um, for transient stages or workflows that go through transient stages like Sledgehammer or the install image, we need to be able to restart at a successful position on failure. So for example, um, we need to be able to reset a workflow back to the beginning. So think of it as like, say I do a workflow that has CentOS 7 installed and does SSH keys, then puts Puppet in place and then puts um, some additional runner services and then stops, right? So you get halfway through that and then it reboots. Well, the way the system currently works, it'll go back to the install, do the install, but we'll skip some of those stages because they're already done. But that was not a complete, completed set of right. workflows. Yeah. So yeah. part of this coming work and around the workflows that, you know, to address like the fan in and fan out issues is also to handle the stage recovery. Okay. So uh, yeah. realize there's still a little bit more work coming even beyond what we'll talk about here in a minute for three, four. All right, so I, I, last thing is like, forget about the, the graphical presentation, but it would be super helpful, I think, to the users to know where they are 
if, if the next thing can be determined, but at least know where they are in the current stage. Yep. Like what is it doing now, you know? Yeah. No, we agree. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to wrap up the discussion on that now. We're uh, eating time up like crazy, which is good. It's good stuff to understand because it's sort of the heart of um, a lot of our design and architecture decisions on, on how and what digital rebar provision is and does. So it's important to understand that, and the feedback, uh, Will, is really appreciated in terms of uh, you, both using it, how to operate it, and how to uh, what you're interested in seeing change in it so we can uh, help guide the, the future direction of the product and, and features and capabilities. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to profiles and orchestration changes. So this is a relatively um, new topic uh, we just added. Uh, recently, and Rob, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about this uh, since this uh, came to me mostly from you. Um, just to, just <laughs> oh, couch, just I see. I it. see how it is. It's the messenger problem. <laughs> uh, so just to couch it real quick uh, to tee it up for you, Rob, if I may. Um, essentially, this is uh, taking a look at our existing content system and how we use parameters and profiles and how we might extend that as a generic pattern use case for doing some cross-node orchestration. So I'll leave it at that, and I'll let uh, you go. <laughs> Making Greg cry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, I, I would caution, the, I would not use the word orchestration. Uh, <laughs> orchestration means something very specific to me. Um, this is this is Coordin some, uh, actually I wrote coordination. How about that? In coordination the, uh, I like much better. Documentation is what how I wrote it. So you're right. Originally, cross node, and I do have orchestration there. So let's strike it's that. Coordination or synchronization. Um, and it, this isn't this isn't designed to replace an orchestration system. But there, what we're seeing is there are certain workloads, uh, like building a Kubernetes cluster, um, where they don't, the, the systems are designed to not need orchestration in their design just to need some coordination. So the example would be in bringing up a Kubernetes cluster, you need to run uh, one of the nodes at least needs to be set up to be the, ho the host node or the uh, admin node. So it has to be run with some different commands. It generates a token that then has to be passed to the other systems. So there's a leader election um, and there's a, I have some information that everybody else needs and you better wait until it's available um, activity. Those are, I would consider those coordination activities. And then everything else just waits until that, that it, you get to go. Um, there used to be a project called Dozer um, that would, people were using for this. Um, actually, people use etcd for lock, lock synchronization and things like that. And so it's more in this model. Um, Greg, I, I, I can shut up and let you talk about this, um, or I can keep going if, if I'm doing okay so, so far. Let's keep it relatively brief brief from either of you, simply because we have a lot more that we want to cover with 3.3 as well. Okay. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic, and I also think it's something that um, might be a really good topic to focus and expand on once we've done a little bit more work around um, sort of uh, formalizing it internally. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to, I thought it would be good to introduce here for sure. This yeah, is something I mean, that you'll that will be surfacing over the next couple of weeks for the before the CNCF summit. So yeah. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, no. The basic idea is we need a way to have machines communicate to each other through a common place, and profiles are the way we're going to do that. So just realize more will be coming on that. Excellent. Um, I'm going to step over into community feedback next. Um, I'd like to toss out and put uh, Will and um, uh, Chris, and if our newcomers are willing to fess up and, and talk a little bit here. Uh, if not, that's okay. I see we've got also Rob Phantom has dropped in uh, while we're talking. Carl Perry, if you guys have any uh, thoughts or ideas on what you'd like to see in the next meetup, uh, we do like to incorporate community involvement and feedback as much as possible. Uh, the last two uh, meetups uh, were very heavily focused around stages, runners, jobs, work queue, uh, which was born out of a lot of questions and uh, interest from the community. So um, I think one of the things we'll definitely focus on is a little bit more uh, on the use case of the profiles for the uh, cross-node 
coordination and synchronization, not orchestration. Um, but in addition to that, what are some interesting ideas uh, coming from you guys out there? Any thoughts? Just to give you a, a, a funny bit of feedback, uh, when I was at Chef, we used to refer to uh, the, the thing that you just described as little O orchestration. <laughs> little O, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I am actually curious on uh, details with the, um, uh, the templating system for example, doing kickstarts. Um, okay. Uh, how, wh where to put things? How to put things? Uh, I'm I'm still trying to I'm I'm still very very uh, new to DRP and I'm trying to get my feet wet and I've got a bunch of projects that I want to complete with it, um, but I'm kind of struggling with that at the moment. Okay. It's it's not so much like how does the templating work? Like I understand that it's going templating and, and, and that's awesome, but what I'm I'm failing to understand is how the different parts of the template fit together. So like for example, Greg's SSH key comes in every single uh, install of DRP and like how do I make a new Probably stop making Greg's SSH key the default. <laughs> <laughs> Greg like yeah, own thing. Greg does this Greg will own the infrastructure world. <laughs> it's only added into the system as a side effect of using the example profile. So yes, no, I, I understand, but it's it's basically like how to how to properly set all of that stuff up. What information is available um, so that I can do things of like you know where where do I. Um, where do I pull stuff like SSH keys? How can I configure additional IP addresses if I wanted to do that? Um, I want to make additional users. W what's the right way to do that? You know, thing things like that to to get off the ground because I don't necessarily um, don't necessarily want to just put an SSH key as root on every machine. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that I would like to do is change the SSH config um, during the kickstart process so that, you know, it's somewhat secure when it comes up. Things like that. And that hasn't been super clear to me. And I may be overextending what I should be doing with DRP. And that's fine. Um, getting that feedback is also super helpful. Actually, so those are some really good points. And um, we have some of what you're looking for spread out all over the place. So what I would suggest, um, if you're running into specific questions, ping us on Pound Community first and foremost, uh -huh. and we can point you at what we do have, and uh, we'll smack ourselves on the hand for the pieces that we don't have. Um, <laughs> we, are working, we are working hard to try and um, bring the doc up to date. It's been um, a slow grind in the background um, of me doing a lot of the doc, and I know that there's a lot of pieces and parts missing, so if you have specific feedback on uh, focus areas for us. That's good. Um, I would suggest um, basically if you have some patterns, um, for example, a specific kickstart that mm -hmm. does something interesting like you were suggesting um, better securing open SSH, that's a pattern that we'd be very interested in seeing. So if you had specific recommendations for that, we would love to either take um, pull requests, preferably, uh, mm -hmm. if not pull requests specifically, um, input and feedback into that to making the the overall solution much better going forward for everyone and we can sort of abstract that generically across all the different uh, boot environments and templates we use or we can point you in the right direction for drafting and, and crafting uh, okay. of that so that you can create a, a pull request that will require minimal i mean even if you don't know how to use the, the templating stuff to make it generic for us shoot us a pull request and we'll, we're really happy to work with you to you know to, to help a help teach you how to use the templating to make it generic and b that makes you you know a much better operator in 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 using the product yourself yeah so i i guess one of the things i'm a little confused then is like so i i didn't think it would be something that could be generic because like for example you'd be integrating this into a kickstart script and putting something like that in a kickstart script is going to be very different than putting it in the uh, for example, the post exec section of a, a, a DE bootstrap. And so I was kind of like, mm, I'm not entirely sure what's the right way to do this. Yeah. Um, in, in some cases, it's maintaining content, you know, doing the same thing in split environments because of Ubuntu's seeds, precedes are different than kickstarts, et cetera. Uh, but 
Yeah. Some of the things that's interesting with the runner stuff is that um, obviously the boot environments have slightly different execution spaces, but the, the goal that we've kind of been trying to move to, or at least I've been, is that for some of those tasks, like creating users and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, you could try and figure out how to do it with a kickstart, or you could build a task that adds users. And then that could be functional across both Ubuntu and Linux, right? Post install and pre install. Right. And that gets done as part of the runner in the cherooted environment after the installation is completed, but before it reboots. So there's. Oh, okay. So the point is there's some interesting choices and options available, right? You could build a template that was injected into the Kickstart that did right. that, right? As part of the kind of the user creation part of Kickstart. Or what I've been trying to kind of move people to is suggest, look, do the basic install and then write what you're used to writing, which is, you know, make user blah, right? So, it's, yeah, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. The only thing I, I figured that the, uh, the runner was only going to execute on the um, sledgehammer environment because it wouldn't necessarily be available in things like uh, Pixie Boot environment, or not the Pixie Boot, but the, uh, the, like the Debian installer, or the CentOS installer, or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in so, all the boot currently. That's, okay. Uh, that's an advantage of our Derp CLI being a Go binary. If we want it in an environment, we just copy it over. Okay. And it basically yep. works. Yeah, that, that, that's a very simple model. The GRP CLI is, it enables our runner functionality. It's super lightweight. Uh, we stage it on the endpoints, and after, as part of the boot env install process, we can drop it in place and use it to manage jobs and workflow. Uh, as post, uh, as provisioning and post provisioning activities, it can even live on in your OS environment and do interesting things after the fact. Uh, by default, it goes away. Uh, uh, Greg and uh, Victor will keep me honest there, um, because from a security perspective, you don't want an agent running there. In some cases, in some cases, you want to be able to enable uh, deeper. Uh, 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 machine um, life cycle management. And that would allow us to do some other interesting things as well as uh, allow you an administrative day two operational integration point. Sure. Makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to close that up uh, because we're running down to about 20 minutes left and we have uh, some interesting things to talk about with DRP version 3.3. As some of you have may have noticed on pound community, uh, there's a bit of discussion about, oh my goodness, uh, version 3.3 dropped. Yes, indeed. The rumors are true. We did drop 3.3. Uh, mentioned it a little earlier uh, in the meetup today. Uh, we moved uh, to version 3.3 because we extended the subnet API. And so we have a, a raw document we've started to uh, formalize uh, what, what changes um, cause major minor and patch number updates. Uh, none of it's particularly earth shattering. It's pretty standard uh, fair and what, what those things are. They're well documented. We just wanted to put together a formalized document. We'll present probably at the next meetup once we have some time to tweak it and, and run it through. But it, according to that process, subnet's API adding new capability uh, requires uh, minor version number uh, bump up. Um, uh, Victor, was the subnets API tweak, was that yours or was that Greg's? It was mine as a side effect of the proxy DHCP stuff. Okay, that's where it came in from. Okay, yeah. so um, give us give us the overview. What What is it that we tweaked and added to? Um, so for subnets, we added the proxy and uh, Boolean flag on the subnet. Um, this indicates that that subnet should not act as a DHCP server, but act as a proxy. DHCP server. The idea is that when it sees DHCP discovers, it will send an offer that doesn't have an IP address, but has the boot options needed to uh, do a Pixie boot. This is a parallel kind of response that goes next to the existing DHCP server on the network so that they don't fight each other with regard to address assignment, but the 
booting client can get that information. It needs to boot if it doesn't have an OS installed and stuff like that. So the idea is that you set the, you kind of configure the subnet like you normally do, but instead of worrying too much about your address ranges, you just set the proxy flag to true, enable to true, and make sure you have the boot file and next server set to the uh, DRP instance, IP or endpoint IP, and it will let you do stuff with a DHCP server that's already on the environment. Okay, excellent. And uh, which sort of leads, or I, I don't know, we did that maybe tail following the, the dog or something, but the, since the subnets with the side effect of the proxy DHCP, new right. feature, proxy DHCP capabilities. So we had, um, and this is actually came in from community as well. We had a couple of community users that were operating uh, digital rebar provision endpoints in an environment uh, that had a limited DHCP capabilities. Um, in one case, it was specifically a Wi-Fi based DHCP service, which didn't have any support for adding uh, Pixie option parameters to pass through. They still wanted to manage their DHCP leases from their Wi-Fi device. Uh, the other case is uh, in, in environments where you don't have control over the primary DHCP service in an environment, you need to be able to operate um, uh, cooperatively, which is um, the proxy DHCP service capability. Uh, so th that came in from community. So the net effect is now um, digital rebar provision endpoint has the ability to A, be a full-fledged uh, DHCP service and manage the Pixie provisioning options fully, which is sort of the, the, the standard model we um, recommend, but we also operate just a, a um, uh, successfully in a model where your DHCP service is external, uh, you do have to ensure your configuration of your DHCP um, Pixie options is correct in that environment. And now the third model, um, we can operate as Greg was just uh, mentioning, the proxy DHCP configuration. So that, that's a, a really nice feature release that came out, uh, came out of the community feature requests and it makes sense definitely to put in place. Uh, mentioned uh, also, uh, we, I should mention that also coming in from the community was a request for ARM64, uh, v, ARM v8 builds, and, and ARM v7 32 uh, bit binary builds of the digital rebar provision endpoint services itself. So we uh, added experimental feature support for those so that we're actually cross compiling now for ARM64 and ARM v7L, uh, which is the 32 bit binary release. Um, warning, the experimental label there is just as says, it's experimental support, it's not very heavily support um, tested. Uh, we do still do full unit testing of the code, but the actual binaries have not been executed very heavily in the field. So we offer uh, the suggestion that caution, uh, sharp edges might cut you uh, with ARM platform support. The other very important note is that this is purely a digital rebar provision endpoint. So you could build DRP or rather run and operate DRP on ARM hardware. This is not adding boot M support at the moment for provisioning OSs that are on ARM platforms. So that's down the road feature uh, that we'll be looking at uh, when the opportunity comes up. This is interesting because um, one of the things at Racken that we um, very much um, believe is an important part of coming technology in the, the field is edge computing and a lot of the edge platforms are starting to operate on much smaller hardware platforms from Intel Atom to ARM uh, platforms and so this gives us the opportunity to extend into those environments seamlessly. Uh, if anyone in the community uses our ARM uh, binaries we'd love feedback from you on um, even if it's just as simple as hey thumbs up that's working for me uh, we appreciate that feedback we're still evaluating uh, whether we're gonna leave the ARM v7 uh, 32-bit release into the uh, zip file distribution simply because it, it bloats things up from a um, size perspective. We may uh, evaluate whether to leave that in or out based on community feedback. Doesn't mean that the feature goes away. We can still cross compile for it. It's a matter of whether we're just distributing it by default. A, a quick note that I want to give you on, on the ARM stuff is that if you're using ARM v7L, it will not work on a Raspberry Pi. If you use ARM v6, it will. 
<laughs> see the arm list just keeps growing and growing and growing on us. Yeah, well, I mean, so, if, if if you make if you make a six, six will run on seven and ARM sixty four, but okay. seven binaries will not run on a Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi is a very weird SOC and it doesn't implement all of ARM v seven. Okay, so that's that's good feedback. Um, it's very easy to actually add the ARM v six build. Um, Carl, if you have that was Carl, correct? Yes. Yes, it was. I have lots of info okay. I can give you. Awesome. I would love some feedback, particularly. Um, mostly, I, I need to be able to write, rewrite some of the install scripts so that I target the platform and, and just you know pull out the correct binaries. So if we move from an ARM v7 to an ARM v6 for compatibility reasons build, uh, that's easy to do. I wrote the build uh, script changes such that we can do 5, 6, 7, or 8 relatively easily. Um, it's just a matter of uh, flipping a, a number in the uh, build script file, uh, but the install scripts need, I need to know, you know, a uni minus s what it returns to be able to put the right binaries in the right places. I am surrounded by various arm boards. I can give you uni minus a's or whatever for a variety of pieces of hardware. So no problem. So Carl, you've just been drafted as our arm expert and you're going to become <laughs> our QA and test department for arm platforms. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, I love it. Perfect. Um, one of the last features, uh, uh, Victor, this was a lot of work that you've done. I think this is your third rewrite on uh, third language um, writing some generic templatized um, tools to inject uh, OS repository changes into bootenv configurations. You want to talk a little bit more about that feature and, and what that gives us now? Sure. Well, the uh, the brief summary is that the the uh, basic content has uh, grown a new parameter called package dash repositories, which contains all of the uh, necessary data to essentially define your own internal package repositories for OS installation and provisioning and you know, post install updating, you know, all that other fun stuff. And the uh, templates have uh, grown a couple of, or have grown a few new helper functions that know how to use that parameter to uh, write out uh, the correct uh, stanzas needed for uh, dealing with uh, uh, app style and yum style uh, external package repositories, along with uh, how to write out the appropriate lines and starts and net precedes to use uh, those repositories. Um, if you can pull up the documentation for that on uh, read the docs, um, that's probably the easiest place to, uh, that's probably the easiest way to take a look at that. Um, I'm on uh, latest. Actually, this actually is a, a, a very brief segue that I was going to cover earlier. Uh, we've had a lot of um, questions about features and capabilities. Uh, we're in the, do the discussion about documentation is moving fairly, fairly quickly. We highly recommend everybody in the community, if you see in the lower, uh, right corner of the screen, there's a little pull down that lets you, uh, or a pop up, or whatever the heck you want to call it, lets you select a different version of doc that you're on. You'll see our current version 3.3.0. We do recommend for some time going forward now to use the latest version of docs. That's where we're keeping most of things updated before we advance tip or a specific version number. Uh, so to catch the latest documentation. Victor, apologies for the segue. Uh, where in the docs did you want me to look? Uh, scroll under the table of contents. Um, let's see. Uh, not there. Where is it? Hang on. Hang, you're reading. You you're scrolling scroll. a little too fast for me to actually see it. Uh, scroll back up a bit. It's under architecture. Oh, yeah. Architecture and yes, data. Data? Yes, that's obvious. So hopefully and obviously named there. Um, <laughs> that's on my list. Yeah, so if you uh, scroll down to, if you, if, if you see the table of contents there, there's an entry for the repo object. I'm going to scroll back up. Uh, the table of contents on the left side, or the right side, rather. Uh, packet, there's a package repository entry about five bullet points down. Yeah, that one. All right, so everybody sit quietly and read now. <laughs> um, probably um, the easiest thing, though, so we have an so example of a package repository. about a minute to wrap up there, Victor. Okay. But if you scroll down about uh, a couple more pages. Uh, 
Okay, keep going. Yep, that, that, that bit that you just, that bit right there. That is the TLDR on how to use package repositories. You set the package repositories parameter and then in your kickstart or your pre-seed or your post install environment where you're wanting to write out uh, uh, dot repo or um, sources dot list files, you use these lines. Okay, so this is the Golang template stuff specifically that would be injected into the boot env to realize the um, package repos and then the uh, params. No, that's remote root access. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Moving down too far. Yeah, the dot install repos, that's what you throw in a Kickstarter or a pre seed to have the lines that define the repository, that it would spit out the lines that are necessary to install from those repositories. And the dot machine repos uh, line is what you would uh, put in a template that would get expanded into a sources dot list or uh, a dot repo file that would contain uh, all of the relevant entries for the operating system that the machine is running. Okay, excellent. Based off of uh, the OS uh, clause in the package in in uh, in, a, in any given uh, individual package repository. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then last on the agenda is uh, some grooming of backlog. Um, we're going to go through this really fast because we're running down to about seven minutes. We want to make sure we get a, a few minutes for community feedback and questions. Um, uh, we have a lot of stuff that's dropped into the backlog recently. Um, machine inventory, I think um, we left that at completed. The only thing left to, to fully complete it is some more documentation around it. Um, documentation, and we found a, an awesome bug where on a uh, a VMware, on a the VMware server, the line. volume of data that was returned by Derp CLI was too large to yeah. be processed as a command line. So we need to... Uh, uh, one of the hmm. Derp CLI things that I've been working on is to make sure that uh, setting an attribute can accept input from standard and so we don't run into that however many character limitation again. Okay, excellent. Uh, we'll leave that in the to-do line still. Uh, default stage transition, uh, Greg? Uh, Greg had to step out. He got a phone call. Greg, st Greg stepped out, okay. Uh, so let's see. Um, I think uh, let's just run down the list in the backlog and see if there's anything we want to advance, and then we'll. Your, uh, your sorry, go ahead. No, up. and then we'll then we'll uh, turn over to community and wrap up. But go ahead, Rob. I was going to say no. You've already got you got some things that actually uh, pulled over. Um, the integrate uh, common package repo rendering functions is pretty much done. It's even documented. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And the uh, proxy mode is, yep, okay. Uh, uh, that's actually a, a brief, one we want to talk about very briefly, too. It's an interesting change. Um, the how to run DR provision of the existing DHCP server uh, from Rothgar, I think, is just a documentation thing that should go into to do the uh, DHCP proxy whoop, itself has been done, but he asked for some documentation, rightly so, around that. Um, just going down the Machines list real quick. is tricky. Yeah, it's a reasonable request. Um, yeah, but for now, the actually with the patch with, with patch being supported, we can probably just make it a uh, editable field. Yeah, well, I mean, it's always been you don't you've always been able to change that name. Uh, the okay. unique yeah, identifier is the UID. So I don't know why it's not. Uh, I'll put that in to do. It's trivial. Okay. Will, you're going to get your wish there, it sounds, before the next uh, meetup. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm Rob's making Rob take time. some time off for Thanksgiving here. Rob is going to leave his phone behind for a few days, right, Rob? You're not going to do anything electronic? You're going to focus on family? Uh, I won't contact any of you. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anything That's else we want to move over right now? <laughs> I don't think so. All right. Um, so I will go through the current to-do log, uh, make sure the uh, this afternoon and make sure that the tickets are annotated correctly and then move them to completed. Uh, and I think that will is going to end up leaving us. Uh, machine inventory will sit in to-do for a little while due to the current bug and documentation. Um, I'll touch base with Greg on default stage transition and see if he's ready to close that one out. 
Um, I will look at documentation uh, for DR provision. Is that feedback from me? I got a weird feedback on my side, sorry. Um, uh, Rob is gonna take a look at uh, editing machine names. So that's a real to-do for the moment. Uh, the uh, allow DRP to restrict TLS ciphers that came out of uh, request to uh, ensure that we don't allow clients to communicate to us with uh, weak or middle strength ciphers. So you can actually flag DRP endpoint to enforce uh, strong ciphers uh, from a security uh, perspective, uh, compliance requirements. Um, and I believe that is pretty close to done. I don't know that we've test finished any testing for it. Uh, Greg finished that up, I believe. Um, and then the uh, DHCP proxy mode can move to John, I think. Yes. And integrate common package repo rendering will be moving to done, completed as well. Um, so that's sort of a, a brief uh, rundown on uh, things we're advancing for 331, uh, or if there are any API changes that require a minor version bump to 3.4, uh, to be looking forward at the next meetup. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up, uh, open up any questions, not a whole lot of time for uh, the peanut gallery, but if there are any questions from anybody out there that we want to uh, talk about now or things we want to drive for discussion for DRP, go. I had a note for you that didn't, you didn't show the um, endpoint setting. The end? A, the, new, the new endpoint naming feature. Ah, yes, that is true. Um, I can demo it very briefly. I, um, small in, it's a small feature, yeah, uh, but it's nice. Definitely, it's adding. Uh, you pop out, and right now, as you can see, my registered endpoints list are all IP addresses. Not very friendly. If you go down to your organization endpoint names, uh, we now have this um, capability to add um, more interesting names. So this would actually be Shane's uh, five min DRP demo, long lived cluster. And then I can now save and also remove list. So it's a nice feature to be able to add um, a little bit of endpoint management capabilities uh, to naming get away from IP addresses, et cetera. Rob, I think, um, did you do most of that work or is that you and, and Vic, uh, Greg collectively? That's, or That's me. If it involves icons, it's usually me. <laughs> like Especially and, monochrome and, uh, icons. The things that you'll get is the pull down on team. If you go to rack and team. Uh, team uh, here, get, yeah. Yep. Uh, well, icons will come in on that one shortly too. Awesome, excellent. So some features um, uh, releases capability um, additions to the UX, continuing and ongoing, sort of independently from uh, DRP uh, endpoint feature release. Uh, anything else from community you wanna uh, briefly talk about? All right, then we're at the top of the hour and we're going to wrap up. Uh, Digital Rebar version six meetup, it will be on December 5th. And that'll be hosted just before KubeCon kicks off in Austin, Texas, where the Racken team is going to be at. So if you uh, happen to be at KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, uh, please come by and see us. You're gonna be able to find us because we're all going to be wearing kilts, right? Right, Greg? <laughs> Greg's gonna have a kilt on too, everybody. Uh... Maybe. And, uh, so, <laughs> I think, so I think the meeting started to break up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you anymore. That's <laughs> right. La, 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 la. La, 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 exactly. All right. And uh, I'll get the uh, version six full meetup agenda posted uh, within the next few days and published to community. Uh, appreciate everybody's involvement. Uh, it's great to have community feedback and involvement and see things growing. As always, Digital Rebar is at rebar.digital, rackn at rackn.com. Uh, and you want to interact with us, please. Slack is our preferred mechanism. Town community is a good starting place. And uh, YouTube, we have a number of videos and demos on YouTube uh, on version three uh, usage and scenarios. Everybody, thank you very much for your time. Uh, let's wrap up and push the stop button on recording here, everybody.